The Get Down is brought to you by Digital Music Pool. Digital Music Pool is the ultimate record pool for professional DJs looking for the hottest tracks and exclusive hits updated daily in an easy-to-use platform. You can find exclusive edits from myself, Cream, Adam B., Andrew Marks, Angelo the Kid, Armin Averro, Chumpian, Dan FX, Castra, Pat C., and Samus J. only on DMP. And we're giving you a chance to try their service for just $9.99 for the first month. All you have to do is click the link in the show notes or on the Get Down or Cream Instagram pages, create an account, and enter the promo code CREAM at checkout for your discounted month. DMP is my go-to record pool for new and exclusive music to play in my sets. So become a member for just $9.99 for the first month with the code CREAM and check it out for yourself. Click the link in the show notes or on the Get Down or Cream Instagram pages to sign up now. You will not be disappointed. If you love listening to The Get Down, you will love the video version of our show on YouTube even more. With all new audio and video upgrades, we've taken the show to the next level. On YouTube, you get to see our facial expressions, hand gestures, and real passion we have for this industry and for helping you grow your DJ business. Click the link in the show notes or on the Get Down Instagram page to watch the podcast now or search Get Down DJs on YouTube. We would greatly appreciate if you subscribe to our channel, like, and comment any questions you might have that we could bring up on the show. What's up, guys? Welcome to the 125th episode of The Get Down, presented by Digital Music Pool. My name is Cream. Gary W. here. I missed one episode. I don't even know what episode we're on. <clears throat> it's been a week. We're a hot mess, guys. All right? <laughs> so we're warning you going into this episode. Uh, we, we're we're going to quickly record today, so this might be a little shorter episode. So we're, we're going to get right into it. I don't think we're going to get into the banter here to yeah, start. Yeah, that's fine. So I, I was having a conversation with someone, and... They were complaining about the price of a DJ, and he said something along the lines of, "Well, you know, we we pay him, to, we pay this guy to press. Well, I'm not paying that much money to pay this guy to press play, but like, and you know, obviously, I, I have thick skin, so I let it roll off my back because I know these a lot of people, owners and managers, and people that just don't get it will say dumb things like this. But you can't say that, and then at other points of conversation, say, well." We need the best DJs in here. And Kareem, why are we losing money if, you know, because the DJ wasn't that good or whatever the case may be. You can't, you can't have both sides. We, we have this conversation. We've had this conversation before. And it's, it's making sure that you highlight the good nights to those people, to those bookers and to those managers and those owners and, and highlight that, okay, this is where a good DJ made you a lot of money and making them aware of those those high points and then also highlighting the low points as well. Like, okay, well you had this guy here and you lost the crowd and you, you didn't do so well and at the, at the register. So we'll make sure we don't book him here again, but this is also why ha- paying up and having this better DJ, this is why that's worth it. Right. We, we always hear the negative first, but I think it's also trying to highlight those those high points as well and yeah. why and why it's important on the good nights. I think it's really, it is really important to make sure you have those conversations. And, and like we always talk about, it's really good. If you could find out how much money that the venue rings when you're there, you can, this is where you use that information. Right. Well, Hey, X, Y, Z owner. Every time I book Gary W, you guys make 5,000 more dollars. Right. So, so what's the hundred bucks? Why can't you pay bucks? Gary the extra right. two hundred dollars that he's asking for right. when he's making you five thousand? It's I mean that's all just simple math. But a lot of times that these owners and managers they don't want to get into the numbers with you. I mean I kind of understand that, but also some of them are just being lazy and they don't want to get into the numbers. Period. Because well that's not really part of what they do from an ownership standpoint. They have somebody that takes care of all that stuff. Right, right. and they're not just going to talk to any DJ about their their revenue and stuff, unless it's someone that they trust and work with regularly. So I, I understand that part of it. I think it's going to the booker too and just being like, listen, like follow up, see how the night went. I I um, actually hit up one of the managers last week because uh, 
my hair the dog set like i felt like it was solid but it took me a little while to get going i was telling you that um because like walking into that set's a little weird 11 p.m you're kind of transitioning right. off of the other dj so it took me a little bit so i followed up the next day and i was like oh you know how was the night like you know i thought it went well i had a lot of fun you know just got got the feedback that way i think that's always a good way to follow up because you'll get a pretty true response like oh my god that was amazing you know can't wait to have you back or oh yeah the night was good you know like you, yeah you'll, you'll know exactly uh kind of what the night went like I bring this up because it, it kind of goes hand in hand with uh, the conversation we had about people thinking that DJing is easy. And, you know, that was one of the TikToks that really went pretty big for us. And, it, you know, there was a lot of people in the comments saying like on both ends, you know, saying that DJing is easy and saying that I can teach somebody how to beat match in one session. But then other people saying, well, yeah, that's not the point. The point right. is being able to take people on a ride and hand and, you know, be able to DJ a whole night and be able to, make the venue money. But I think DJing is, is easy as one of those stereotypes, but I also think DJing is like this glamorous thing is another stereotype, especially from people that even people in the industry who think it's glamorous, you know, and outsiders forget about it. Like glamorous to like, what you like, what are like some highlight, like highlight some like glamour, what would what, what some glam things that go along with the glam stereotypes that go along with DJing? Well, like as a headliner DJ, you know, you have a rider and they're giving you bottles of vodka and you're walking in and uh, what else? I don't know. Like I think you're getting paid a lot of money in a short period of time. I think making I I think looking at DJing as real entertainment is something that has only changed very recently. Like you had the DJ to DJ the party for a long time, DJ on the block or whatever it might be. And it's turned into you, you know, it's you're a band. It's a band, essentially, right? Right, um, right like rock star status. The DJs are rock stars, not necessarily the rock bands anymore. Right, and that's and the perspective needs to shift on, for, on all levels. Like you know, from every person. Like yeah, we look at, we look at DJs as rock stars because well, we're DJs and we look up to certain DJs. Um, whereas you know, maybe some older people like they grew up idolizing bands and. That's why maybe the, the the shift needs to to be made a little bit mentally that DJs are they're real entertainers, right? You know, and yeah, sure, it looks like you're just up there pressing a button or, or something like that, but like it's it's so much more than that, right? And we, we've we've talked about this time and again. It's, it's you know keeping energy in the room and being on the mic and being entertaining, um, you know, because that's you you are an entertainer at the yeah. end of the day. Social media also feeds into this stereotype because. All of us, me included, right? We're, we're posting the best possible clips and the best moments of our DJ career, the biggest shows, the biggest reactions. I don't post the time when there's 100 people in a 1,000-person club and I'm playing and I need to somehow make this a good night. Yeah. Or when I'm in traffic for five hours trying to get to another state so that I can grow my network there. Or, you know sleeping for three hours to get to a gig in the morning after being out until four in the morning. Like nobody sees that part of it. I, you know what? I, you just came up with a whole new content creation, uh, idea. I, you can just, you, you have to start highlighting your lowlights. <laughs> I think that's somebody, maybe I should do that. I think that'd be, it that'd, would be very interesting to like, you know, Hey, like I'm, I'm now in Delaware three, three, four hours later. You know, and, and trying to get to DC or, or whatever it is, there's a yeah. lot. There's a lot of negative that goes along with it. It's it's not it's it's not easy. Those 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 high points of your DJ set, it makes it all worth it, right? Because it's such a it's such a rush, right? That it makes all of that travel and all the stress and the no sleep and makes it all worth it at the end of the day. Um, but I, I think it would be funny to see somebody just do you know being on social and like yeah. showing all the the. I've, I've been lucky that, you know, my low points recently ha haven't been that low, you know, but thinking back to other parts of my career, there's been a lot of really low points, you know, we've all had low points. We all have to do that. Most of us to be able to grow and get better and gain experience and then be able to execute when you in, you're in those high leverage situations and like to the outside and everybody just seeing the, the like I said, like the the one little minute of high energy, crazy excitement that happens throughout the course of a week and all the other stuff that goes into being able to capture that one minute in time on a Saturday night in a nightclub. It's important too to, 
it's important for young DJs to understand like you, those low points are going to make you a better DJ in the, in the long run. And I, that gets lost too when consuming social media. It's like, well, why can't I be doing this? Well, because that person probably did a lot of, a lot of yeah. nothing for a long time. Even the big producers and the big, the guys that play big festivals and, and huge stadium shows, you know, they all started somewhere too. They just figured out how to grow to get to that point. So in most cases, there are so many low points, so many just like, I can't believe I'm DJing to 10 people in this room and I have to be here for another four hours kind of thing. Yeah. Like, I don't know. I don't think people understand all that stuff because they only see the good parts. Yeah, it's it's tough. Social media has made it, made it a lot more convoluted because, because like, like you said, you're, you're seeing all the best parts of what DJ. I is. think, I think people are jealous and that's a big part of it too, because we get to do something really fun for our, our, for our jobs, right? Like we get to go and play music and make music and go and be in nightclubs and, and, you know, interact with fans and we are, literally getting paid. And if we want to drink, we could drink. Like what job are you allowed to drink (laughs) while you work? (laughs) Not, not many. many. (laughs) So I, I, I guess there are definitely some haters who like have never experienced that or don't get to feel that. And, and that's part of it too, where it's like, Oh, well your job is so easy and you just hit play and it's all, all big parties. And like, (laughs) shut up. I hate you. (laughs) All, all I hear is our buddy Jay Diamond's voice when you're uh, when you're doing yeah, th- that. This would have been a great <laughs> shout to Jay Diamond. You know, big promoter. Yeah, New, New Jersey, Jersey Shore. <laughs> He's always calling us Mister Press Play and all that. <laughs> <good stuff. laughs> oh man, but yeah, I, I I think this kind of goes into also you know what our next topic would be is you know how how to be a better DJ. And, and how to improve your DJ sets. And I had a couple of conversations with DJs last week and trying to coach them up and how to be better DJs was, was one of my conversations. The other one was a fellow DJ came out to see me and made a comment on like all that I'm doing while I'm mixing. And I, I just turned to him and said, you know what? The, the reason that all of this is happening during just one mix is to make sure that there's no empty space. And, you know, the, the, least bit of empty space that you can have it keeps your it keeps the energy up for your set and it it's can really set you apart like not being lazy for any portion of the night like at that point i didn't have a lot of people in front of me there was no dance floor everybody was just still drinking hanging out it was early in the night but it's it's important to do all of that stuff all throughout your set because you want to sound clean and you want to sound like you're keeping energy in the room and you don't have any any like lulls right in your set It's gotten to a point now where the quick mixing and playing a lot of songs in a short period of time is kind of the only way you could really capture an audience, at least in the top 40 bottle service style club bar. You know, if we're talking like house sets, techno sets, tech tech house sets, where we're playing more extended version, that's a completely different story. But in the top 40 clubs and bars, this is the only way for you to keep people's attention. You can't have the four bar sub down sweep where there's dead air. Right. If there is, you better be on the microphone yeah. or you better be doing something else. You better have like a clap intro lined up to help fill that space. These are little things that whether a, a booker or an owner or manager knows it or not, they hear it, right? They, they, they don't want to hear the dead space. They don't want to hear the song that has the really slow buildup where the crowd's just kind of looking around. That's why I create these club edits, right? Like I create club edits for the club, you know, because yeah. I use them in my sets so that a John Summit track, while amazing as amazing as it is, it might not translate as well to a top 40 club. Right, a lot of like, he's a great example because a lot of his stuff does have these long lulls, right? That if you don't have a very house-driven crowd, right, it, the, those club edits are, are essential. Right. Um, I, you know what, it's something you said I want to go back to. It, it's... Even in tech house or in Afro house or Latin house, like once, like if that, if that, um, like drum, like drops out and you just have percussion, like you better fill that space with another, with, with another drum coming in on the other. Yeah. Like you have to think about all of those things. Even when you're mixing house music, it's like, you don't want to have lulls in there either. Like, right. 
you know, if, if the, the vocal comes out on one track, like I want to make sure. And then the next track comes in, I want to make sure the vocal starts almost immediately. So you don't, so you, you keep interest with the crowd. I, I think it's, it's even more important with house music to, to not get boring because it can get boring quickly if you don't mix it the right way. When I first started mixing tech house back in 09, like I, I, I was like, Oh, this is so easy uh, at first. My thought was, this is so I, I was, I was the guy saying this is easy. This, yeah. de- this style of DJing is super simple. And then I went and played a, a, a nightclub. And then I, I realized I played love New York city back in the day, which was super dope house spot. And, um, I le- quickly learned that like I have to be I can't have any of this empty space here and this is what makes this is what sets apart the great tech house DJs to the, the average ones right um, yeah like look what James Hype's doing well that, that's just ridiculous what he does <laughs> <laughs> that's next level that is next level that's like top of the top but I, there's other uh, like Steve Angelo is another one you know like lots of decks lots of things happening loops and and using builds and you know, another super impressive, not just mixing two tech house songs together or house, house songs together. You know what? I, I think that's a great, those are great ways to DJ. I mean, you, you just, you should always be as attentive as James hype is during his set. That that's how when you go, like, listen, you just have two decks to mess with Yeah, it, and make the, make the most out of what you're, what, what you're doing right there. Like if you're just sitting back and like mixing a song and then like, going to take a drink and talking to a friend. Like that's not why you're there. Like right. you're there to fucking work, go to work. Yeah. You know, I, I, I like the, just like the echo out mix. Like it's just fucking lazy, you know, like you have to be thinking two songs ahead. And then you also have to be thinking about, you know, every element of the, of the song, the, your booth monitor isn't there just to hear what you're playing. It's, it's so you can hear every element of the song and then, use all of those elements to mix in your next track. You know, it, it, I mixed a bunch of salsa last night and I was very clean with it, but it's so, so hard to mix if you don't, if you're not being super attentive. Somebody came over to talk to me, actually Greg came over to talk to me and like, I'm like, I'm so, I really can't talk right now because there's just way too much happening in this song right. for me to get into the next song cleanly. Um, just stop being lazy. I think that's probably the best, the best advice to give there. All right, so we brought this in with like ha- ways to improve DJ sets, right? And, and create a better nightlife experience. So you said no empty space, right? We don't want any of those sub drops where there's dead air. Like that's dead air is the worst possible thing you could have in a, in a club unless it's pre-drop, yeah. I think. Yeah, um, The next one we said was no low energy. And I think that's in your song selection, but really in the way that you're mixing the songs. And I brought up quick mixing before. And that was one of the ways I set myself apart when I first started was quick mixing everything. And the older DJs who were kind of on the scene were like, dude, what are you doing? Like, why are you mixing that way? And, I'm like, and I was like, well, I only have a two hour set. Like I could jam more songs in and right. I, I could, I could play more music and keep the vibe higher if I, if I quick mix. And now it's like, if you're not quick mixing, you're, you're not getting booked period. No low energy gets, I think, Mis- misconstrued sometimes where I, I think younger DJs think no low energy. They think that the, the song tempo needs to be high. That's not it. It's the no low energy is making sure you fill those dead spaces. Like we said, right. And you're not playing full songs, right? You're not playing full songs. And yeah, because I get that complaint a lot from bartenders. We're like, Oh, that DJ played a lot of bunch of full songs and like they're noticing, you know? Yeah. Um, so yeah, don't play full songs. And then the other one would be it, as the cleaner you are in your set, the more energy you're going to have because you're going to keep this consistent flow. Yeah. Whether the the people in the crowd understand what clean mixing is or not, they'll know if you fucked up and managers know if you fucked up or if something sounds off, it's very harsh to the ear when you're not mixing cleanly. And it's very easy. Think about as DJs, right? When we go in rooms and we hear other DJs, they do, there's one transition that might not be perfectly clean in like the eyebrow or the ears perk up. And it's like, we hear it. So any minute detail because we're in it, but even regular people and customers hear it and, and recognize what it is as well. More than ever, because people are consuming DJ sets just, you know, in their downtime as music that they're listening to. So everybody knows what a clean mix sounds like, or definitely they know what a train wreck sounds like. That's for sure. Yeah. 
One other piece of advice I'd say for DJs, and this goes for a lot of the stuff we're talking about uh, is kind of more important. It's always important, but it's more important on those slow nights, right? And we, we talked about the slow nights or the, a little earlier, but everyone's listening on the slow nights. It's, it's an opportunity for you to play for the decision makers many times. So even if it's a slow night and you're just up there and like, going through the motions, someone's going to notice and they're more likely to notice because it's slow and they don't have customers that they have to take care of or they're, the manager's not running around putting out fires. Like more people are watching and listening to you. So my challenge to you guys is no matter how many people are in the room, no matter how high or low profile your gig is, go into it and execute your gig as if you're in a massive jam-packed room. I can't express how important this is because as bookers, we get the phone calls. This DJ was on his phone. This DJ left the booth and put a, was gone for three songs and we didn't know where he was like this shit matters guys. And I don't know if all of our DJs understand it, but I I know that everyone listening doesn't fully understand that part of it. And as someone, I have to catch myself too, where I'm like, cream, you're just going through the motions And then when I actually put in that extra effort on a slow day, I I get instant results. The people that are there are vibing way harder and I'm having a better time. I don't believe in a slow night. I I, I truly don't believe in a slow DJ set. Like I, the worst one that I've had since I was up here was like a very early day set. It was like one o'clock set and there was like eight people up there. And like I pushed myself through, but I looked around at each one of the tables that was there and down the bar and was like, well, what do I think that these people would like? Right. And then like dug into DJing to what I thought like each table would like and kind of dabbled in a little bit of everything. Like you have to make yourself want to be there. And if you don't want to be there, don't take the booking number one. And maybe you're doing maybe maybe DJing's not for you. Because like I'm, I get excited to play new music and different music for different crowds every time that I DJ. No matter where the set is, no matter how packed it is, you know, if there, like I said, if there's eight people or there's eight hundred people, like I'm going to continue to try to do something different in all of those sets. And I think that's what keeps it more interesting. If I find, catch myself on my phone too much, like that drags the day out more than it makes it makes the day worse. It makes right. your set more boring. You're there to DJ, so do it. You're getting paid, you know, X amount of dollars per hour, which is more than you're going to get paid at most jobs. Keep it interesting and make it interesting for yourself and make yourself a better DJ in, you know, in taking advantage of of those slower sets. Yeah, I mean, I think that's really great advice. It's the only way, like, I can get, like, I'll do, you know, we all, I talk about all the time, I do triples, and, like, sometimes those early sets are tough. But, like, it it makes my night set better because I I maybe found a couple new songs to put together or a new genre that I haven't dug into. I don't know. There's multiple things that you could do for your mental headspace to make those yeah, boring I think sets being better. Being able to test some new records or play some genres that you're not used to playing and seeing how things go over. I think that's a great that's a great way to use that time for sure. The other the other point I want to make is uh when you're there and and you go into a set thinking that it's going to be a certain style of music or, you know, for example, I, I, I played a set in New York city on the water. It was an afternoon sunset set and they told me a certain style of music and I went in and I was playing that style, but the people there weren't reacting to the music I was playing. And I, I was like, all right, do I do what this person told me to do? Or do I do what I think is going to work in the room? And I think we have to be DJs and we have to play to our crowd and, and read our room and understand what's happening. And I did that and I got such a better reaction and it was such a, a more fun day and night. And I'm sure they made more money because the, the people that were there heard what they wanted to hear now and they were having right. more fun and I'm sure spending more money. People are going to spend more money when they're having fun. There are you always say shallow end of the pool. Like when, when you are in a situation that maybe the booker tells you to do one thing, but you feel like doing this other thing is going to work. You enter into that other genre in the shallow end of the pool. Maybe you playing the more popular stuff that you can get 
get over with the booker and being like, oh, like I'm playing this. To, it's a bigger record. Yeah. And then once you garner that response, then you can kind of ride it out and you can let them know like, hey, like I switched it up. I tested something out and it worked and I kind of stuck with it. And communicating that. We've talked about that I think, yeah. a few episodes ago, but like communicating that with the booker or manager is important. In this particular instance, he was like, oh yeah, that's usually what happens towards the end of the set. The crowd changes over. The nightlife crowd starts coming in. And I always play that style of music. And I was like, oh, well, my instincts were right. I did what I thought was the right thing to do. And he confirmed it when I talked to him the next day, you know? Being being a DJ is, is just, it, it's important. Don't, don't just get stuck with playing the stuff that supposedly works, right? right? Like, this is what works in this room. Like, yeah, well, that could work in that room yesterday. But today it's not going to. Yeah. It's, it's kind of one of the funnier situations and, and conversations that I have with with managers, they're like, somebody said it to me last week. I'm like, so wh- where do we want to start like today? And he's like, do what you did yesterday. I'm like, well, what I did yesterday is not going to work today. It's a completely different crowd. And you have to keep that in mind no matter where you play. And especially when you play in our market, that is so diverse and so different. And the Saturday crowd's different than the Sunday crowds and different than the Friday crowd that you have to be a DJ and just be on your toes at all time and be reading the room constantly. We talk a lot about Birch, right? Birch is a big nightclub here in New Jersey. Uh, you know, we book the DJs there and I've been a resident there for, since it's open and people will ask me, well, what's the vibe? And I'm like, honestly, it's different. Every time I play there, sometimes I play a ton of hip hop. Sometimes I play a ton of EDM and barely play any hip hop. And it's all on Saturdays. And it's like, it's hard for me to explain to someone who's going in there new what to do, because it really depends on who's there. <laughs> like, yeah. And that's a big top 40 bottle service club, you know? Right. I, we, our market doesn't, we don't have the, we don't have the strictly hip hop room. We don't have the strictly house room. There's not many of them for the, unlike the mid level, you know, sure you have, you know, the, the hard ticket places. It's a di- different story. Not talking about those places, but like, we don't have a lot of mid level places that just stick to one genre. It just doesn't happen. Yeah. Uh, I'm trying to think of, of cert, like we definitely have venues that lean a certain direction usually. Sure. But I, I think that being as versatile and being as open as possible and be, being, like I say, being a DJ and, and being able to kind of do what feels right for the room at the time is, is very important. I would love to know. I wonder for you guys listening, would you rather go into a gig and just plug in and, and play with no background information? Or do you guys want to know, you know, what generally works in the room? I mean, I, I like, I would generally like to know what's, what's played, but like my style probably isn't going to veer too far off of what my regular set would be. Right. Um, but it's, a, I always, f- I always find that what that general style, whatever works in that room Whenever maybe I'm fishing for a song, like I'll lean back on that stuff. Yeah, if that makes sense. Like if I'm like, oh, I'm like kind of like losing direction on my night right now. Like I don't really know where to go. I fall back on like the the go to genre all the time. Yeah, I I want to know. I want to know as much information as possible because I'm I'm a big preparer. I like to be prepared. I like to know. I like to know what to expect, but then be able to pivot and do what needs to get done to have a successful night. Yeah, it makes sense. I'm, yep. I'm big on like asking managers. I, I'll ask everybody, managers, staff, DJs. Like I want to know, I want to hear what all these different people say so that they all say different things. I know that I have to play a bunch of different things. Right. If they all say the same thing, it, it's like, all right, well, this is going to be an EDM night or this right. is going to be a hip hop night. Yeah. All right, let's, let's transition here. I, I think, I feel like we've been shitting on venues a lot lately, but <laughs> I, I've... I've had a couple conversations in the last month or so. One from, actually both from owners. Uh, one who was looking to hire Get Down, sort of, they wanted to hire our DJs, but also wanted us to promote the night, um, which is not really something we do, right? Like, yeah. we're not promoters. We're a DJ booking agency, and you know we help manage DJs, and we're not promoters. Is promoting our events something we do? Absolutely. It is promoting the things that our DJs are doing something we do. Yeah, of course, but we're not promoters, right? Like we're not getting paid to bring people out. If you want to pay us on a per head or you want to split the bar with us, that's a whole different conversation and something that we 
right. would do, I'm sure, or right. at least consider doing. But like one of the conversations was, hey, can we spend some more money to bring in some bigger acts? And the, the immediate response was, well, are they going to bring more people? And I was like, well, no, they're not going to bring more people. They're going to make you more money, though. They, they might attract a newer audience or, or you know, bring people that – new fans or right. – but, like, just because you're spending more money and bringing a new artist doesn't mean that they're – they paid more money because they instantly bring more people to your venue. Like, Yeah, it, it's definitely a misconception that – I, this happens a lot with business owners that don't dabble in major nightlife, right? Like they just don't know how to go about the night where you have the $2,000 DJ. Well, how, how am I going to make that extra, you know, whatever, whatever it might be, 1400 bucks. Right. Like, why am I shelling out this much extra money? How, you know, how can I f- set up my night? And like, sure, we can guide them, but like, we're not really paid to do that either. Right. You know, like, which, it's not our business. It's not our business to to right to set. You want to hire me as a program. consultant? Right. Sure. Right. <laughs> you want to hire? You want to add us on as partners to your Saturday and Friday nights? Sure. Right. Yeah. But uh, that's where that's where it falls short. It's the education part of the the hiring the bigger acts and and you know how is that going to benefit the the nightclub or the or the lounge? This all falls under the same realm of like oh, well, it was a slower night or whatever. We're going to pay you less. All right, well, if that's if you're going to pay me less on the slower nights, then on Halloween, I want double, triple rate. <laughs> like, yeah. And, and if that's the deal that they want to make, then sure. Because I I personally think that my nights are going to do better than other people's nights. So I'll, I'll bet on myself all day if you want to, you want to make that bet. <laughs> yeah, I, I don't... Th- there's not one owner that would take that offer. No. Not one. Because on those nights where they crush, like you'd be getting paid stupid money. Stupid. So like it's, it, it, if you're a smart business businessman or businesswoman, you don't take that yeah. any day of the week. I think the, the way that everyone needs to think about hiring either more expensive or, or ticketed artists, there, there's two ways to look at it. The first way is you're bringing in a higher profile entertainer to market your venue and maybe open it up to a new audience that's not used to coming there. Not only that, your 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 regulars, the people that are there every week, you're doing something new and exciting that's going to keep them coming back. So you keep your regulars happy and you also potentially bring on a new clientele. And to me, like that's invaluable, you know? And and even if you're doing a, a ticketed event, you're capturing emails and names and phone numbers and birthdays and that is so valuable as well. And I just don't think owners totally understand that part of it as much. And they're just really looking at the bottom dollar. Like, well, if I'm spending this much more money on a bigger artist, then I need to make that much more money. I need to make X more dollars for it to make sense. Well, no, maybe you break even, but you're, you're gaining this other, these other aspects and these other things that are helping your business in the long run. I think new, new business owners, I think understand this more than the, the older nightclub owner that that lived in a different generation where like the information capture is so so important right like we do it for you know we do it for everything that we do there's some kind of information capture like you guys put out a song and like you 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 know you're putting it out on uh what should we call it hype edit Uh, yeah and hype edit and and like it's just getting information is so important it's it's so overlooked with the older with the older owners because yeah. they just don't understand how big that is to, to future, um, yeah. Future business. It's just short term thinking. It's not big thinking, you know, I get it. You want to be fiscally conservative. I understand that, but I think sometimes it's, it's will pay off in the long run. If you take a risk and you try something new and you do something different, I think we could take that advice as DJs as well. And, and, Sometimes it's really important to take those calculated risks, and I wish more venues did it for sure. You don't have to take these risks weekly. You can do them quarterly. You can do them. You could do take two big risks a year and see if it pays off long run, right? And then for the next year, you're like, okay, well, we could roll. If I did did it twice last year, maybe I'll do this quarterly next year. This way, if it's a financial risk, you're not going to bury yourself, right? Yeah. 
And if there's any owners or managers listening to this, I think that's a, that's a really valuable thing to think about is that you don't have to go all in every week. You can go all in once, once a, quarter. a quarter and, and it's not going to, it's not going to sink the ship. You know, I, the payoff long run, I, I know for a fact when you, when you invest in yourself, you invest in your business, the long run payoff is always worth it. Right? Yeah. I, yeah. I, I don't think enough people are investing in themselves, you know, DJs, especially you, like you have to, you have to invest in yourself in order to be successful long-term. Yeah, I something totally agree. D, something DJ cream taught me. <laughs> it's important, man. It's really important. You, sometimes you got to spend money to, to grow your brand. Sometimes you got to spend money to, to make money, you know, and that's like a, a, such a cliched, but it's true statement, but it really is true. I think going back to the, just to, to, convincing venues to spend a little more money on the local level, you know, maybe, maybe you are, you, the, the places are paying one DJ to play a whole night and you're paying X amount of dollars. Maybe you're trying to convince them to put it openers on and bring in a higher caliber headliner style DJ. I think what, what you really got to hammer home and we as DJs know this, but that DJ might not bring, might bring zero people through the door, right? Because that person's book, booking and gigging, multiple nights a week and, and have been doing it for a long time. And most of the time those DJs are older, right? Yeah. So maybe they don't have as big of a following to get the actual bodies through the door, but the dollar amount that those DJs are going to make you on the back end again, right? If I can make you five grand more, th th there's your, your extra 300 bucks that you're right. looking for or whatever the number is, you know? Right. And I just don't, they just don't understand that part of it. And it drives me crazy. Communicating that, like we said earlier, communicating the, at the high points and is just as important as the owner slash manager communicating how bad a performance was. Yeah. Right. And in those opportunities, like we said before, where maybe somebody's getting complained about would we'll be like, well, for three hundred more dollars, this would have never, ever, ever happened. Right, three hundred dollars makes you three thousand dollars. Like, I, I don't. If, if you're a business owner, how does that math not make <laughs> sense? Like, I'll never understand this. I will never understand it. It just doesn't make any sense to me. But. It's it's something that that we deal with a lot um, as bookers. But if you find yourself in a situation where you are negotiating, you know these are all all good tactics to keep in mind. It's honestly on like it, it doesn't just go for headliners either. It goes for openers as well, right? Like yeah. you want the promo opener or you want a person who could actually DJ that can set your night up for success. And that might only be a hundred dollars that they're fighting about. Like it's a hundred bucks. It's owner. Inc it's incredible that that's what it takes. It's like a hundred. It's fi like we're pulling teeth at for fifty dollars sometimes. You know, it's 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 wild, um, but. This is this has been the industry forever. Like like I said a couple episodes ago, like met somebody that's been making three hundred bucks since eighty eight, which is crazy. Yeah. I mean, I don't know. I don't know. <laughs> I guess I've been a little negative, Nancy, today, guys. I apologize. <laughs> <laughs> Conversation. These owners get me fucking fired up. Yeah, you've had a lot of a lot of tough conversations in the last couple of weeks. But it's, it's been a lot. It's that it's that time of year, though. It's you know, it's prepping these guys for what what's to come, especially in our market, being that we are in the slower summer market. Um, it's prepping them for the big push that happens in the fall here, where uh, you know you guys might have it a little opposite. I you know I. I uh, shot a video for our team today in discord and it was about just this. And for, I want to share it with you guys, the listeners as well, because if you're not in the vacation market, if that's not where your, your home market is, your market's probably slower. All the cities markets are slower right now because everyone's at the shore the beach, the lake, whatever it is. And right now, this dead time of July is probably one of the slowest points of the entire year for all of our venues, right? Everyone's on vacation. There's less people going out. There's less people spending money. It is most important for all of us as DJs to promo our gigs and promo them harder than you would normally S because slower dollars are less. Owners are looking at bottom dollar and they're like, well, why are my, why is my staff not promoting the event? How come the DJ only posted the flyer? I'm spending money on this flyer. Get ahead of it. Go double down on your promo right now. And 
if you're bringing people out to venues, make sure that your booker knows that you're bringing tables or selling bottles or whatever. Show the value in the slow part of the year right now, and it's going to help you during the busy part of the year. Yeah, it's huge, huge. It's something that that is definitely overlooked because owners right now are way more involved in our market than they than they are through the rest of the year because they're yeah, trying they're up to, my ass. They're trying to think think of ways to boost business right now, and they're going to look at all their bartenders, Instagram and social media, and they're going to look at all their DJs, social media, especially the DJs, because I mean, that's where the a fat part of their money is going, going to be spent, right? Those bartenders are all tipped right. employees. And they think that us as DJs are bringing 30 to 50 people out every time we DJ. Right. So, so yeah, ha- definitely be a little proactive here. And, and, and this way, maybe you can negotiate a better rate come, come the busy season. Yeah. So, all right, we're going to wrap here shortly. I, we haven't done this in a while. I, I'm putting you on the spot, too. Okay. What are you listening to these days? I mean, I just... <laughs> this is a bad question. <laughs> I just came back from three nights in Boulder. To, I listened... But, Gary's been on his hippie shit for like a week. I've listened to nothing but Grateful Dead for a week. Literally nothing but. But Sounds today, terrible. <laughs> for you. All different shows. Or amazing for you. Um... I just, you know what? Oh, I was coming over here, and I, there's another band coming through uh, Orlando that I put on, Band of Horses, that I, I really like, but that's not really... I feel like I heard of them before. It's not really... Yeah, they're all You, older, you older probably bands. played it. But um, nothing that like anybody's going to ever DJ. It's just like a more band stuff. Been into bands. That's what I've been listening to. We've been, to. We've been talking about uh, the, the Young Thug and the Lil Uzi albums that dropped in the last week or two. I got another thing I'm going to follow. And... I finally was able to give the Young Thug album a, a run through. I mean, it's really unlistenable. <laughs> it's just not good. It's not good. I wanted it to be good. There's a couple tracks that are that are I would listen to in the car for sure. There's great production on the album. I liked a lot of the beats. Okay, but like it's just not that good. Obviously, the two Drake songs are are pretty good, but generally we know that's going to be pretty good. We um. We're gonna have. A, we had a disagreement about something. I'm gonna bring bring it up. Um, the juvenile tiny desk. <laughs> that I listened I, to like the first three songs, and I thought it was incredible. And I thought his flow highlighted why hip hop used like was so good back in that era because people had such different fl- like you could distinguish different rappers by like they have very distinct flows. Where there's gonna be an old man in the room comment, but like. I feel like so many rappers now have very similar flows, right? It's just very da 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 Where like Juvenile was like that. What I don't know what the first song on the Tiny Desk was, but it was so, it was excellent. I didn't know the song at all. Number one, and number two, it, he kept my interest just because of the, how he was delivering the 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 lyrics. So like, and all obviously the the live band element was so. Uh, caught my attention i thought that was super dope but so i i haven't watched it i i've seen clips on social so i i can't necessarily defend my take but i heard him and i'm like man he just doesn't sound that good but maybe i i need to give it a full listen we're gonna, we're gonna listen to it over on our ride over to hoboken i also want to give every person listening homework go on spotify right now and listen to juvenile ha please he, he did he did it he did it he did it it was good it's one of the most incredible songs of all time. Either it, it's either so bad that it's good, or, or I think it's an incredible track. <laughs> but you know, we grew up on that, so it's it's pro- we're probably a little biased. But there's uh, a Twenty One Savage song that that I used to always make fun of that reminds me of it's very similar. It's just very repetitive. All the all the the rhymes are very repetitive. <laughs> he basically, like Juvenile to- just ends every single line with "ha," and and that's the way that everything rhymes. So. He's still, I, and I thought like in the tiny desk that he delivered that so on point where like, I don't know, like the timing and sentence structure, everything was just so perfect. Like it, it, it'd be easy to fuck up. And when you go back and listen to it, the band, it almost sounds like the band's off and he's still like keeping his, his flow pretty tight, which I was impressed with because the band was losing me a little bit. Manny Fresh, one of the greatest hip hop producers of all time that gets no love. Oh, he was he was great too. Just as just as great. Anyway. Love him. So <laughs> so good. Um, all right, are we promoing anything? I know, all right, we're promoing the 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 boat party, which is tonight. We got a boat party, UFO, so Rendine, Timo, 
are DJing on the boat party. Tickets are still available. Check the link in our in the show notes or bio if you want to get a last minute ticket. Also, we have the Disco Fries album release party and networking event. Uh, that is also tonight. So if you guys are local and want to check that out, DM me. I can get you on the list to get in for that. Uh, besides that, Garrow, anything else? That's it. That's it. All right, guys. Thank you for listening to this, to this episode. We'll talk to you guys soon. Peace, guys. Peace. Thanks for listening to the Get Down Podcast. If you enjoy our show and find the topics entertaining or helpful in any way, we would greatly appreciate if you could subscribe, rate, and review our podcast wherever you listen to it. We want to help more DJs, and subscribing, rating, and reviewing the show is the best way for us to do that. We appreciate all the love so far. Thanks for listening, guys.